see you all. I uh, have to admit, you know, I, we're months in now and was worried about sort of Zoom burnout for everybody, but we've got a nice group here and uh, we want to welcome, welcome you um, on behalf of the International Women in Multiple Sclerosis Network for our leadership seminar, which I'm co-hosting with the unstoppable uh, Myla Goldman. My name is Fiona Costello, for those of you who don't know me, and we are pleased over the next 60 minutes to discuss the theme of advocacy. So it's the patient clinician researcher continuum and really touch on how we can all help one another. So our honorable guests today are Cindy Zeggy Boilo, and Cindy is the CEO and president of the National MS Society. And we have Pamela Valentine, the president and CEO of the Canadian MS Society. And so without further ado, perhaps we'll start with Cindy, not showing US preference here, just going with the alphabetical sort of drive. Cindy, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your path to this role, and then Pamela, you can take it from there. Great, I'm not used to going first alphabetically. <laughs> that's, that's okay. <laughs> I'm sure Pam isn't either, so we'll, no. we'll wing it. <laughs> well, my interest in nonprofit work really boiled down to one thing, an interest in, in human beings' resilience, a desire to have a positive impact on people's lives, and that's really how I approached my what I wanted to do in life. And so this was the focus of my studies in college and graduate school. I wanted to understand why some people, when faced with a stressful or negative situation, why while some people thrive and others self-destruct, what makes some people happy and others unhappy. So this was um, this led me to an interest in organizational development and social psychology, which essentially is the study of how you can influence large groups of people, which you can imagine as a leader of a large health organization can come in handy. So for me, the National MS Society was a perfect fit. And I began my career in 1985. And my job was to connect people to information resources and each other so they could overcome the challenges of MS. And back then there was no internet or no treatments for MS. It was, it was an isolating, disease that could be incredibly devastating. And so connecting people with each other systematically and routinely was a critical function of my work. And I loved it. And I continue to love it. And it continues to be true to this day. So I've had many roles in the National MS Society during my 35 year tenure. I've had an opportunity to work with all kinds of different people, developing and delivering programs, educating healthcare professionals about MS building nationwide services so that no one's alone with their MS, and of course, fundraising, volunteer engagement, planning, management, all of those things that running a large organization calls for. So learning about the effects of this disease on people's lives is a big part of what fuels my passion. I'm positive that I am in good company among this group. Um, we know we can, we can help people live better. And, uh, and I want to change lives to the better. And I know I'm with a group of people who share that feeling. And so knowing what people want from their lives is really critical to understand. So I became president and CEO of the National MS Society in 2011. I have known all the past CEOs of the National MS Society, including our founder, Sylvia Lowry, who was a strong and passionate woman who was driven really by a desire to end this disease that took so much from her brother, Bernard. So my job now is to develop and then implement a strategic plan that leads to a world free of MS. That's all. <laughs> we strive to find a cure for MS as we ensure people affected by MS can live their best lives. So it's an honor to be here, an honor to do this work and to get to work with so many amazing people who want to contribute to a world free of MS, a common focus that brings us all together. And I know all of us on this call together. So I'm glad to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Thank well, you, Cindy. I think, yeah. Go I, ahead, I, I think yeah. you understate your impact. Uh, when I think about Cindy, you know, she's done so much for the MS Society in the US, but she has equally started to change uh, the face of MS at a global level with the work that she's done on the Progressive MS Alliance. So, so <laughs> there's part of her CV she hasn't really talked about. Um, 
I came probably from a different perspective to the MS world um, in that I trained as a neuroscientist and I was a neuroscientist um, early on that was a basic researcher but embedded in a clinical unit and that really started me thinking about the translation of research knowledge, asking the right clinically relevant questions and answering them and, and how that translated to um, making a difference for the patient. And so I very early on in that uh, experience started to think about where I could have an impact. And um, while I thought I could do good science at the University of Calgary, I thought I probably could influence the entire health research enterprise in the province of Alberta when I joined what was the Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research, which was the provincial research and innovation organization for, for the province. And, increasingly got given jobs along the way that were um, not just running the science uh, uh, administration, but really thinking about the things that could advance um, implementation of, of research findings um, for the province of Alberta. Things like trying to, you know, wrap our heads around a much more integrated um, human research ethics uh, uh, system within the province. Um, I then ended up running Alberta Innovates Health Solutions for a number of years that was really trying to think about the interface between the health system and the research system um, and, and how that could work uh, better. Ended up then getting tapped on the shoulder um, to integrate Alberta Innovates, which was four entities that covered the health organization that I was running. Uh, agriculture and forestry, which I knew nothing about, uh, energy and environment, and an entity that was focused on technology commercialization. So really thinking about that research to innovation uh, continuum of, of activities. And when I finished doing that merger, started to look around at organizations where I thought I could make my next step, and um, the MS Society of Canada was looking for the CEO. It perhaps brings me back to my neuroscience roots, so really um, thinking about how my scientific uh, experience could, could lend itself to driving a strategy for the organization that was really focused on the impacts that we were wanting to achieve. And I think one of the important elements of, of what I've brought to the organization and what Cindy just talked about was thinking about how the the MS community as a whole, not just the MS society as an entity or an organization, but the, the, the community as a whole, by coming together and working together could achieve so much more than what an individual organization um, could do on its own. And so it's that sort of, um, you know, communicating and, and catalyzing and bringing groups together towards a common goal that, that I really thought, you know, the MS Society had the perfect elements to take us forward. Of course, we're challenged with the current set of circumstances, um, but I still think there's, there's a huge amount in the MS world that um, we have going for us in terms of that connectivity. And that this group is, is, is one of the um, groups who can help continue to move that forward at a, at a global level that is absolutely required to find and bring solutions that are meaningful um, to the person who's living with MS. Um, I think that was awesome. Thank you both. I'm taking it in. Um, but I think that that you're right. That you know, this is there are challenges right now in front of us, right? But I think from challenge comes opportunity, and I think you know we have such an innovative group, and I think that um, you know. That, that this group connecting all of these people all over, right, is part of that opportunity that we'll be able to face this, that we might not have. You mentioned, um, Cindy, starting without the internet, you know, I mean, it's hard to imagine where we would be if this had happened to us, you know, in 1998, uh, 80, you know, four, as, as it were. Um, so, you know, one of the things I wanted to, to ask about or hear your thoughts about is, you know, I think leadership, is always a unique journey for every person. I think it's particularly um, a unique path when women find their way through leadership, even if they're following um, behind other women, that, that we're all still, you know, kind of finding our own way in, in, 
in different circumstances. So I'm curious to hear, um, what would your current self, your today self, tell your younger self if you could speak to her maybe 10 years ago or five years ago um, and share with her if you could go back in time? Um, and then sort of the follow up to that is, you know, where do you see yourself kind of going next um, with the next five to 10 years of, of where you'd like to make an impact? So kind of just anchoring around where you are now, looking back and moving forward. Um, and we could have uh, Pam go first to uh, flip-flop the order, perhaps. Sure. Um, I, I wish I could have told myself 10 years ago. <laughs> um, I, I think I would have told myself to believe in myself to a greater degree. You know, it sounds trite, and I'm sure lots of people have answered the same question in, in a similar manner. But I'm not sure I knew what I would be capable of doing from a leadership perspective 10 years ago. And, and if only I had trusted in myself to a greater degree, uh, you, know, you don't know where you are. So I would tell myself not to see the boundaries and not to see the limitations and not to accept the limitations that were often told to me in, in various um, places. The other piece of advice that I have increasingly tried to give to myself and uh, I wish I could have given to my younger self was to stop and take breaks. Um, you know, you can take little mini breaks on a daily basis. I think that's one of my coping strategies right now. Um, but I also, when I took a period of time off between leaving Alberta and taking the job um, with the MS Society, I had a year. And it was probably the most important year of my career, despite the fact that I wasn't working because it really let me take stock of what I'd accomplished, what skills I had generated along the way, the lessons in leadership that I had um, managed to learn, where I thought I still needed to um, develop and therefore where was the best place for me to be able to really make a difference because um, when I think about the next five to 10 years, I'm not sure where I want to be or where I will be. What I do know is that there will be an opportunity that comes in front of me that will be so interesting and so juicy, I can't help but take it. Um, and I don't know when that is, no time soon. <laughs> we have to get through the current sets of circumstances. But if I had have reflected more regularly throughout my career, I, I think I would have had a clear sort of path and therefore, a bit more deliberate in the experiences that um, I would have wanted to get along the way. So who knows what's next? I'm, I'm not really thinking too, too much beyond the next couple of years. <laughs> or the next Zoom call some days. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cindy, what are your thoughts? What, what would you share with your well, younger self? I love, I love those comments. I think that we can all kind of um, embrace those and think about that. I, I think it's a lot easier to think about what we do differently today. I always re I always think back, oh, I should have said, I would have said, you know, all that kind of thing. And I try not to spend too much time with that kind of a thought process because I'm not sure that it's helpful. I tend to be focused on the future. But what I would say is some of the, the, the advice that my mother gave me actually is one of the things that occurred to me um, as you were asking this question. Um, be in the moment, even when it's uncomfortable let it happen and embrace being human. And I think that is consistent with what Pam is saying. You don't be so hard on yourself, just, you know, but I, it's a big part. And, and I think for me, recognizing, wow, this is awkward. This is really uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't like this, but then allowing it to wash over you, I find that to be freeing. And knowing that it, this moment shall pass, we'll move on to something else. And, and so the advice my mother gave me, and I don't know if she even meant it this way, but I remember as a child, she said to me when I um, shared with her that I wished for something in the future. You know, I, I wish it was my birthday, or I wish I can't wait for whatever. And, um, and she told me, and I just never forgot it. She said, Cindy, don't wish your life away. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if she meant it that way. I really, I don't know if she meant it to be so profound, but it was profound to me as a young girl. And, um, and I feel like it's an important 
um, I remember it a, a lot and I think about it's important to remember in hard times. Embrace the hard times, let them wash over you, know that they will pass. And, um, and also I think another thing is, is, and this is something I also, when you feel like when I felt in my old self, uh, younger self, I should say, when I felt like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't do this, it's too hard. I'm not, this is, I'm not, you know, equipped. I'm not competent to do X, to do whatever it is, is to remember that you are the best person to do the job you're in. You were picked, you were chosen, you're, you're slotted in there. It's, you're it. It's like, you know, a game of tag. You are it. You, you're the one that can do it. And, um, and so that I feel like gives me confidence just in and of itself. It's like, well, nobody else, <laughs> you know, you look to your, it's gotta be me. I have got to do this work and it's going to be done. It won't be perfect and that's okay, but it is going to be progress. So, and so for the, my future, I don't, I am just interested as I said before, I continue to be an idealist. I am an eternal optimist. I want to make the world better and I want to take every advantage and every disadvantage and turn it into an advantage and 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 end up in a better place. That's just that's just, you know, how about I think about how I think about things without any I, I can't think about five years from now. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, the other. No, that's a, Cindy, that's a fantastic answer. I think it's very interesting because we have a broad range of ages and expertise on the phone. And I think one, one um, burden of youth is that uh, young women and men often wait to get permission or they don't want to overstep or offend. And about the only upside, I think, of becoming older as a woman is you care so much less about that if you're committed to a principle or a goal. Don't you agree? I think that's that's really well said. I think another thing is that when you make a mistake, it doesn't have to be the last thing, especially if you feel like maybe you hurt somebody's feelings or you overstepped yeah. or something. You can always go back and say, I wish I'd done that differently. You know, can I have another chance to do that and just learn from that? And And I think what some people do is they run away after they feel like, oh, I just made a mistake or I just screwed up or, you know, but it's, it's, it's a chance to go back. And in my experience, people embrace those opportunities for a do-over, you know, and they, they remember that part. So sometimes a mistake can be your hugest advantage. And so that's something I think to remember too. If you go back and say, hey, you know, my bad, I'm, I, I want to. I want to try this again. I need some support in getting through this. People want to help. That's fantastic. And um, I want to just gonna... make a. Oh. Go ahead. Bye. Sorry. No, no, no. I just love this little piece, and I think that the other thing this touches on, and maybe Pam wants to add to this, but is the um, expectation of failure, right? That that it's not going to be perfect, and it's not going to be. Um, perfect every time. And I think that's something that we also can struggle with, um, you know, in general, but, but others, but the expectation externally are also, I think, sometimes greater for, you know, women in new leadership positions, that, it, that she's, it's not going to go well. And so I think that to embrace that mistakes are going to happen and then to leverage those as an opportunity is really powerful. And I think Cindy really articulated that very well. So anyway, I just wanted to highlight that because I'm telling myself that every day. I'm going to make a mistake and that's okay. <laughs> so thanks for reaffirming that. Yeah, I think for me, I'm always telling my team, like, do make mistakes and embrace the mistake that you make so that there is something that's learned from it. And I think when you come from a background where you dealt with the innovation process, like it only moves forward by making mistakes. It's fast to fail. And so you're trying to break the product, know where there are weaknesses in order to make it better. And I think when you bring that lens to the work that you're doing and you invite uh, the criticism, you know, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't work for me because um, you get to a better and better place that is co-creating in its process. And I love the teams that are able to do that sort of 
co-creation process. So I think I'm always giving my teams permission and I'm always saying Mia culpa. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't get that one right. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is a stronger way to lead a group of people and give them the permission to try new things and innovate and, and, you know, figure out what the best way forward is because there's always multiple solutions. That's right. You know, it reminds me of a, of my, um, what I learned from my 10 year old son who is now 25, but when he was 10, he was essentially a little mini me, um, except he was male, which is a very big difference. So he followed very, very similar in terms of, I won't give you all the things, but in school, he got in trouble the same way I did. He, you know, all these kinds of things, Every, everything he, he had the same approach. He had the same personality really in lots of ways, except he was more fearless. And uh, he was, and I remember talking with him about, you know, a math test he, he got, he was angry because he got a 97 on this math test. And, uh, and I said, well, that's a good, that's a good grade. And he said, well, I should have gotten a hundred. I'm like, okay, well, what are you going to do? And he said, I did get a hundred on this test. I just didn't answer the extra credit. And my teacher took off three points. And I said, well, and he said, I should have gotten 100 if I answered the extra credit. I said, well, why didn't you answer the extra credit? He said, I didn't need to. I already got 100. <laughs> and so his teacher noticed that he was an underachiever, and she docked him for it. <laughs> he just was like, good enough is good enough. Good enough is absolutely good enough. I don't need to be better than good enough. And that I just thought, wow, I've never considered that. I always considered that I need to do the best. And, and you know what? He's right. Good enough is good enough. I can put my pencil down. I don't need to do the extra credit. I am fine. <laughs> well, that's a good way to segue, I think, uh, to our, you know, participants, because people are being a little bit shy and I think uh, a little bit afraid to come forward. So one positive about the virtual world, and I'll put this out there before the next question, is I used to, and I'm still a person, I hate making mistakes in talks in front of large groups of people, but there's no way to avoid it in the virtual world. Like I've got gas like an American politician now out on YouTube and there's no retracting that. And I feel there's almost comfort in this because it's been um, like a, you know, a brick off my chest. Like we just have to succumb to the realities of this medium and roll with it. And I, I think it's actually liberating in some ways if you're that person who oversteers steers the wheel, you know, to try and make the talk perfect and appear perfect. And you only remember that one thing you said wrong or got wrong, which I suspect is probably a lot of the people on this Zoom call. And so uh, my question to, and we can start with um, Cindy or Pam, I'm I've lost track is, uh, do you believe that work-life balance is a reality or a myth in your world? I think it's a, it's a reality. It's a, it's a goal that I constantly kind of keep at the side of my desk because it's never ever really achieved. I've had times in my career where I've been more balanced and I've had times in my career where I've been way out of balance for sure. Um, so I, I don't think there's this, you know, <laughs> utopic <laughs> kind of state that you, you know, at some point achieve and, and, and because life circumstances change around you in terms of, and the work that you're doing changes. Um, I can say right now I'm way out of balance. <laughs> because dealing with the crisis of COVID has just required that. It's required that in order to find, um, you know, a way through this for a whole group of people trying to make sure that they're there for the MS community and that can't drop. Um, but I think I, I constantly have these little habits that I'm working on to try and make sure that the self-care that you need to do in order that you have the energy to continue to lead are there. Um, Cindy and I were in a, a session at the top of the week that I found really helpful. It was a good reminder with Anthony Feinstein, where he was giving us some tips. And one of them was, you know, put the piece of paper in front of you at the day and write down what, what your intention is. You know, I'm going to do eight minutes of yoga. <laughs> if I get eight minutes of yoga in today, I will have felt like I had done one thing that um, was going to balance that day. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, so for me, it's a constant goal. I don't think I ever truly 
I'm there and I don't have that expectation of myself. I think that's exactly right. You can't, I mean, it is just an ongoing. And I think what it's important for me is to continue to take inventory, to take stock. How am I doing? How's everybody doing that matters to me? How do we make sure we, we make space for that? And I think a big part of achieving balance, and I don't like this work-life dichotomy. I mean, I just don't, I don't think it's separated. I think it's just life. I'm, you know, I'm breathing while I'm working. So I'm living and it's part of my life. And I, I see it that way, much more fluid than a dichotomy. And, um, and I think that helps me. I don't know that it's the right thing for everyone, but I think it helps me. And, um, and, uh, and so to achieve the balance that I want, people have to know how I'm feeling and I have to know how other people are feeling and how we're doing and what we need to get done for the day. I, one thing I'll say that I think that as a, as a young professional that um, I wanted to share with this group, um, in addition to all the things, the great things that Pam said, but lower your expectations is what I learned quickly. The house doesn't need to be quite that neat. The bed does not need to be made. Um, it really, really doesn't. My, I realized that I didn't need to blow my hair dry. I never picked it up again after that. I never, I just, I don't need to. It doesn't need to be done that way. It's just those expectations that you have on yourself. You can, you can drop those. But the things that you have to do to eat well, to sleep, to exercise, to establish rituals, whether it's an eight minute or a 30 second ritual and do it daily. Those are important things to maintain and to do and to share with those around you so that they can embrace those as well. Those are fantastic responses, uh, Pam and Cindy, and good reminders, you know, to all of us. Um, we have a related question from the audience, I think somewhat, and that is from Sarah, who's masked and working in clinic. What has been, there, Sarah, uh, what has been what you consider the most sort of pivotal challenge you've each faced as a woman in your leadership role, and it can be this role or any role. Maybe Pam, we'll start with you. Um, the biggest leadership challenges, and I've had a couple of them that, you know, um, they were wicked problems, um, have always been when the people that I was working with um, were coming from different perspectives, like wildly different perspectives. They might've even actually had an end game that was different <laughs> and trying to get them to see some level of common goal and keep their eye on the prize in terms of that common goal. That's always been the, the, the biggest, you know, leadership challenges when it was going well and when it was not going well, um, you know, to make sure that, you're constantly sort of re-checking in that um, you, you're, you're moving in the same direction towards the same um, common goals. And that lack of understanding of various groups that you're trying to move in, in one direction, getting them to have a common language, a common understanding, all of that, th those have been the biggest leadership challenges. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a lot to add. I think I think the big, well, I will say the biggest challenge, it's related to what Pam just said, um, is articulating what we're going for. Being very, as a leader, being very clear about what the goal is. And when you can be that clear, then people know how to contribute. And it, But it's not always easy to clearly articulate how you want to change the world or what you want to make happen or... Um, in ways that people can then see the work. For instance, right now, we are working on establishing international consensus on pathways to cures. That's big, right? So we need international consensus. And why do we need that? Because everybody needs to see the path to MS cures so that they can plug in and they can contribute along the way, however they wanna do it. We don't need to define that, but if we all know where we're going, then we can find ways to get there that contribute to the path. So whenever you determine, you know, so being able to really clearly articulate that, those visions I have always found, whether they're big visions or small visions are really, can be, can be just hard and getting it right. Um, and it takes a lot of conversation, yeah. Well, that's what I was just going to ask you, because I, I think that's such an interesting and important perspective that, you know, I hadn't thought about before. But do you have a 
a process that you do that? Do you have a group of people that you soundboard off of? Do you Mm. do it on a vision board and draw pictures? Like, do you have a process that you go through to articulate really sort of right blue sky um, ideas like you're talking about? What could you share? Well, uh, one thing is it is always a group process of, so in my, for me, I mean, there are, I, I feed from other people's ideas and um, then most everybody is smarter than I am. So I like to pull all that together and kind of line that up and work it out. Um, And I, I, and so getting people who have um, perspectives that are different from yours are important and making sure that you, that you're clear. So if we say, okay, what we want to do, and even if you just think, well, you can think about any example, but um, I was talking with a, uh, a, a nonprofit exec, this is a simple one, who was working on, she was interested in, uh, it was a volunteer who was interested in solving hunger. And so I said, well, how do you measure your impact? And this is somebody who was in California who had a, was part of a small group. How do you measure that impact? And she said, I, um, you know, we, we, we measure and count the number of meals we're able to provide. And so it's a math problem and essentially, and I thought about that and, and she wasn't really off offering an opportunity to come, con, con, you know, to have a conversation about it, but that's not solving anything, right? I mean, to know that you fed more people, that just means that those people are still hungry. What we really want to do is keep people from being hungry. I think, I think that's what she really wanted. So really defining what it is you're trying to achieve and then determining. So for instance, MS research, we want to find a cure for MS. So we could, and we have, and I'm still regretting some of the things we've done, measure our impact by how many dollars we spend in MS research. That's not, that's not, necessarily going to get you where it is. What we need is more research to be done. We need more people doing the research. It doesn't matter who pays for it. We know at the National Mass Society in the United States and in Canada, we contribute money toward research. It gives us leverage. It gives us some leverage and some clout and some say, but really what's more important is what are the, what are the, what's the government funding? What is the, what is the pharmaceutical companies funding? What's another foundation funding? Are they focused on the same vision we are? And do they, are they contributing toward that? And how do you measure that impact? That matters more. Um, So I, 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 paying attention to what it is you're measuring, you're always going to get what you measure. Well, not always, but the, you're more likely to get what you measure. And if you're measuring the wrong things, you're not necessarily going to get to the place, to that vision as quickly as you want. And I, I think I've used a number of different processes. My, my thoughts on what processes work, you know, have continued to evolve over the years. Mm-hmm. What I would say are the critical elements for me have been a collaborative process. As Cindy said, multiple perspectives at the table are always helpful. When you're hearing them, I think it's super helpful. And and an iterative process. You you never go in a linear way from problem to solution, ever. It doesn't usually happen. So that ability to collaboratively, with multiple perspectives, iterate to get to where you need to go, that co-creation process, uh, I've always found um, super helpful because you build buy-in and ownership along the way that means that the team generally takes it and runs with it and, and, and helps you get that. But Cindy's absolutely correct. If you don't have common uh, agreement on what the, 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 what success would look like at the end of that, um, it makes it a whole lot harder. Right. And, you know, when you think about our work, uh, we're all working in MS in one way, shape or form, then what's most important? What's most important here was what people affected by MS need and want. That's what's most important. So understanding what that is, you know, there's only, there's, there's, um, we don't, for instance, in MS research tend to measure fatigue in MS and what a therapy does to, to improve fatigue or the level of fatigue. And, and that is the number one concern of people affected by MS. Now, we don't do it for lots of reasons. It's hard. It's subjective, blah, 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 you know, all of that. And it's the most important thing. 
Yeah. So we have to get to it. The end user. Um, okay, so I see Helen has her hand up and she's been waiting patiently. Um, uh, Dr. Tremlett, did you have a question or were you clicking a yeah, button? I'm coming on, on, I might be, sorry. Can oh, you good. Hear? Hello. I'm weirdly staring at I can't actually see myself, but I'm on the exercise bike, which is why I'm weirdly. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really enjoying, yeah, I'm getting some movement in here. So my question is like, um, how hard was it to, for you guys to give up your, I don't know if give up the, is the right word, shift from your previous careers. And suppose I'm thinking, you know, in the world of research, I'd give up grant writing tomorrow, no bother. But I love research. So yeah. I'm curious how it felt to shift away from those things. Um, was, it, was, that, was that a big issue or kind of natural? Well, for me, um, I wasn't sure I was going to be successful at it, Helen. I left Calgary and went to Edmonton to this job, and I didn't sell my house, and I sort of left a path back just in case. <laughs> you know, you don't know how much your skills are going to be transferable, how adaptable you're going to be, and what you've done in a, you know, I'd spent many, many, many years in a research environment, didn't know much else, and then suddenly in, a, in another kind of environment. Um, but I would say, you know, you have a, a, a general set of skills that you're building in leadership, no matter what you're doing, that is quite transferable. And if you're paying attention to the information sources around you and you're an, an, a curious person, which is part of what brought me to research in the first place, um, I was continually trying to learn. And so as soon as I was plunked in another environment, well, it just gave me a whole new set of challenges around learning. So I found it to be um, a really great process. It taught me a lot about myself and every career step that I've taken. Um, I've had a bit of that, that uh, you know, oh my God, am I going to be able to do it that Cindy talked about. Um, but then I got busy learning and applying myself and trying to figure out what works, experimenting ultimately in just a different kind of fashion uh, in my job. I have brought other people from an academic environment into some of the jobs that I've done and it's not always been successful. And I think that key element is sort of that resiliency, that adaptability, that unwilling to not, you know, learn and apply. And I have also learned the things I didn't like. You know, I, I veered away in my jobs from, yeah, I, I was a COO for a while and, you know, I, I learned it, I could do it, but I didn't love it. It wasn't what filled my bucket every day. Um, so, you know, those experiences along the way, I think, teach you about where, where you want to be and where you can be most effective. Yeah, I think that for me, I um, have not shifted career. I've always just built, built on, gone to the next thing. And um, I did very little. I did research in graduate school. Um, and what I knew then was I didn't like to spend eight hours in the library. I did not like that. I was not, it just wasn't fun. I like the collaborative nature. That's um, my but, dream today, eight hours in the library. Yeah, yeah. no, I, you, we need people who love that. I'm not one of them. I'd be the one going in there saying, come on, Helen, tell me everything you know. <laughs> that would be me. I don't want to have to read it all myself in the library. But, you know, I think that's the thing, knowing what you love and doing, doing what you love and finding ways to contribute outside of what you're doing to to accomplish something that that's going to be exciting for you. I think, I think there's, there's always something exciting to contribute to. Thank you. I think it's interesting, Helen. Um, I made a pact with myself just following up on Pam and Cindy's comments when I turned 50, that as soon as I feel that little question creep in, like, uh, gosh, like, is that, too much of a risk or too much of a change or am I too old to do this? I make myself do it. Like I don't mean jumping out of a plane without a parachute, but <laughs> I think it's something we have to actively work against, which is becoming more rigid and afraid of risk as we get older. Mm. Those are just my thoughts, but um, I really appreciate your comments on that. That's given me a lot to think about. And maybe in the fleeting minutes of our hour, we could talk about things that are near and dear to you, Cindy and Pam. So how can we collectively work together to help the societies? Um, we're so grateful that you're both here today. We know you're really busy. We know these are very trying times. Um, I believe that 
IWIMS has an amazing collaborative spirit and we want to know how we can help. Um, I'll start this time, I guess. Uh, I think there are um, some important ways that you can, that you can easily help. So one is as an advocacy organization, um, and I do this with Manuel, you know, and we talk about what are you trying to accomplish, you know, so sharing what we're each trying to accomplish and contributing toward those, having a plan to move forward in the same direction. I think that's, that's one thing, trying to understand what, what we're trying to do. For instance, one thing that, that, I'm, uh, that we're excited about doing and want to make sure we do is help people, women especially, and others, maybe who under, uh, and re underrepresented um, groups, uh, become, um, make their career in MS, whether it's research or in clinical practice. We need that kind of diversity. We need more support around that. So what you can do is share what you're passionate about and share what you know about coping and participating and growing and support someone else. Um, advocacy wise, just join like action alert and, and, and find out what the, you know, talk to your legislators and we can make it easy for you if you just plug in and kind of do that. And then, and then the, the last thing I would say is, is, um, in terms of accomplishing what we need, we are what we call what's called patient advocacy organizations. And so being connected with people who have MS is critically important to our success. So making sure that the people you know, that you take care of, that are part of your research groups, know that they have a National MS Society and what we do and that they can plug in. And what you might hear from people is, well, I don't really need, I'm, I'm all set, I don't really need the National MS Society. Then you can say, well, they need you. And that would help. Um, because we need a, a big movement is going to accomplish more than a smaller movement. And so by getting everyone engaged and focused, we are going to find the end to MS faster. Even if people don't know how they're going to contribute, let them know that they should join. So I would say those three things. Um, I think we've never needed your help, our community's help, more than ever. You know, um, the MS Society of Canada the health charitable sector in Canada is in real trouble. There's, there's no question about it. Um, we've seen 60% of our revenue fall off in a couple of months. Um, that means that we need to pull together as a community ever more tightly than we ever have in order that we can raise the funds that are needed. And the only way we can do that is by raising awareness, by advocating well on behalf of the person um, who's living with MS, the person affected by MS, regardless of the organization that you come from. You know, um, I, I almost want to say I'm not the president and CEO of the MS Society of Canada. I want to say I'm working on behalf of the person who's living with MS. So I think Cindy's right. Get engaged. Get engaged in the way that makes sense for each of you. Um, you know, we have an advocacy campaign underway right now that's called hashtag um, uh, take action for MS. Um, we'd love to get the community speaking louder than ourselves on behalf of the person who's living with MS. And then I think you can get involved in, uh, in, um, in the organizations themselves, uh, in, in whatever volunteer capacity you'd like to, to create more connectivity across our organizations. When I joined the MS community now three years ago, I kept saying to Cindy in the early days, I'm so astounded by how tightly knit this community is. And I had seen, you know, the health research, health, uh, you know, environment writ large. And in MS, there is, you know, a, a, an international federation of organizations that is extremely tight globally. There is now an alliance, so there's an area of focus that is the biggest gap we know in MS. Those organizations, you know, speaking together very tightly. Um, I've had the benefit, therefore, of walking into a network that's extremely strong. So playing whatever leadership role you'd like to play in terms of, of getting involved in Cindy's organization, my organization, um, I, I think adds to that connectivity that keeps us moving together and strengthens 
the movement as a whole, which is really, really going to be critical in the years to come. When I came into MS, and I'd been out of neuroscience for 12 years, and I sort of said, okay, I need to relearn what the advancement has been in that 12-year period, I was pretty astounded. You know, just 15 to 20 years ago, we had three very blunt tools in terms of, of treatments for people with MS. To be able to say, 15 years later, we've got a growing pool of much, much more effective treatments for people. That's a huge amount of momentum. What I want to make sure we're doing absolutely everything within our control uh, to maintain that momentum to not lose that momentum uh, in the face of you know, the reality that we're all facing with COVID. Um, you know, that's what's keeping me awake at night. <laughs> and, and we have to lean on each other to figure out what those solutions are so that we don't lose you know, a moment for the person who's living with MS. Those are so helpful, those responses. And um, Myla, you look like you're about to say something oh. about that. I I was, I was, we, well, but I'll, I'll follow your lead. Do you want to, do you want me to, um, to ask an, one more question or do you feel like we're at a good kind of. No, um, whatever you want. I, I think yeah. you've really given us, I think this is sort of, you've beaten the drum, both Cindy and Pam, and we have yes. sort of something to think about in terms of the follow-up to this discussion about how we can more actively promote the initiatives of the, of the societies, but also partner more directly. And so Milo, what were your thoughts? I have to let that well, kind of percolate. Yeah, so I was gonna ask a follow-up question to, to what Cindy touched on, but I have to say that hearing, you know, hearing you say that the 60% revenue fall off, like I've gotten emails and I've read numbers and I've looked at this, but hearing you say that is heart stopping. Um, yeah. And I almost wonder if, that is some of what is needed when we talk about connectivity is actually having conversations where we hear that in a way that is really, it's, it's, it's ter not terrifying, not to me, but it's very real. Um, yeah. And I think that's hard to get across in like a newsletter with a postcard. Um, and so for those of us whose careers have been interwoven, um, you know, with the society in a, different ways and uh every all of us have benefited in one shape or form you know i think that's really anyway I, I i'm still processing it but that hit me in a way that um was different from having read and been really following this closely because of course you know i have a skin in the game as it relates to research and so on it's really yeah, Start. we're doing we're doing a lot of advocacy in Canada, um, and I'm trying to be actually. I've taken the mantle to be the mouthpiece um, for the health research um, for this for the sector, because I think it's so important the role that the charitable sector plays. You know, in Canada, the 25 major health charities contribute 155 million dollars a year. It supports 1,600 researchers and 2,500 trainees um, to do health-related, proximal to the patient, for the most part, research. Um, and, and I just think, oh my God, we're such a big part of the overall ecosystem that I, I, can't, I can not only have to advocate on behalf of MS, but I wanna be having the right conversation with the federal government, with uh, the tri-council leaders, um, the VPRs from across the universities, all those players that have to understand that this is not a peg that can fall out from underneath uh, so, and, and not have a massive impact. I mean, I wonder though, just as I put on my problem solving hat, which is never very far off the crown of my head. I mean, I wonder if we think about, you know, the. Our, our social media platform, the website that we have. Um, you know, I wonder as we talk about how we can work together, whether just creating a, a video or a platform to tell that story, would that be helpful? Is that the kind of helpful. tangible thing? Yeah, so maybe we can take a conversation offline, but I know we have a group that manages our or does some Twitter work. I'm not very good <laughs> at this, but anyway, okay. So let's let's do that um, 
and I think we should, you know, really think about that. I mean, just, you know, put it on TikTok. I heard that people watch that thing. Um, okay. Okay, so, I have loaded it on my phone, but my kids yeah. can't of me. <laughs> right? Yeah. They'll bring you, they'll give you back their allowance. Um, that's when you know we've really been impactful. Um, okay, so we have five minutes. I just wanted to bring back around, I think, something that, that, that Sydney said about, um, you know, supporting women and, um, excuse me, interruption, um, supporting um, women and other um, underrepresented people within research, within our society, within the community. Do you have ideas about how we can do that most effectively um, from your experiences within the organization or from a leadership perspective? How do we do that successfully? Can you share any parting thoughts on that? It's, it's definitely an important issue. I, I will. I think, um, first of all, it's for us, the organizations that are interested in increasing the workforce around MS, it's important for us to understand what your experiences are like as women coming up in research and uh, and uh, in this case just women or people what are the what are the obstacles what needs to be removed um and so that we can so that we can obviously do something about that and we have uh, at the ms study we you know manuel told me he said you know that people don't have um, maternity and or or parental benefits when they're a fellow and they're not and so we instituted a policy where we then and we've actually supported our first um is it just one now, Kathy, or is there, there are now two on the docket? She's, she's there too, she's saying. <laughs> I can't, but we have, we've just begun to support people who are uh, women who are going on maternity leave. And that, and that is, um, so, but we did, because we didn't see that before. It was not something that was brought to our attention. So bringing the things to the attention that are in the way of, um, do you know the curative polio would have been found earlier um, Jonas Salk wasn't the first one that was on a track. It was actually a woman who stopped her work because her husband wouldn't let her go back to work after she had a baby. So this can't, this is, this is horrible. This can't happen. And we need to, we, we can change that by working together. So supporting other women is really important. Um, there are, and you're breaking through that with this, with this group. That's huge. You're breaking through that with this group. And uh, I think that's a huge contribution. And that's one of the reasons I was so eager to sign on and be part of, um, of supporting the International Women in MS, uh, just such an important group. Now those comments are, are so helpful and I really feel Cindy and, and Pam, for Pam you gave us very sobering statistics. Um, but, and, and Cindy you've given us a, um, really pointed ways in which the National MS Society has advocated for women. And we're very grateful for your response in that regard. And I feel there's been a call to action from you both to us. And so we'll pledge that we can, as our, our executive, think about the easy things are obviously promoting these initiatives on our website, but maybe partnering over something, using social media, uh, raising money, uh, being more actively engaged. I, I have to admit, like I, didn't realize how tough it actually was until I heard those numbers, Pam. So thank you. I believe we have a, a question in the chat and I wanna make sure others on the call have a chance to ask any questions. Um, Emily writes, could we add adoption to that maternity leave policy for fellows as well? I think yeah, that's I'm to sorry. you, Cindy, yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, adoption is included. Mm -hmm. Okay, I that's see. That's wonderful. Um, it's for Laura. fellows. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Laura uh, Negrado has her hand up. Yes. Um, well, thank Hi. you very much for, for your talks. Um, I'm from Argentina, so kind of a very different situation. Wanted to comment a bit on this because, uh, well, I think it's wonderful what you do there, but our situation, it's, it's kind of very different here. Um, our structure of leadership is kind of different for example where i work which is plenty both many of the bosses are still men uh, for example i had two kids two small kids and i didn't get paid um, maternity leave so just so that you can get an idea how hard it is to do ms research and everything 
but I think it's wonderful this initiative of the International Women in MS to like get together and also be able to get this space and visibility because also what you said earlier about this um, trying not to step over but also it's it's hard to get to this point to not stepping over but also being noticed because it's fine to have this equilibrium so well just wanted to comment that because maybe it's i don't know nice to get to know these very different situations in the other world, regions of the world you know yeah i think that's one of the advantages of you know that connectivity that i talked about having msif as an international federation this group have a global lens to it is it gives you know certainly i think from my perspective i'm sure cindy's a perspective of what's happening elsewhere in the world and i i do think that global movement and understanding how much work we need to do from many different places uh, globally is really important. There are huge inequities, whether you think about it from, you know, women in MS research or inequities in terms of, you know, what the person living with MS has access to in terms of treatment. Um, we know those exist, absolutely. Well, well I, fact, and I'll I was, just say- I was trained by, by a McDonald's mm -hmm. fellowship from the MSIF at SEMCAT. So I, I benefited from one of those initiatives, yeah. Nice. I think what's important to, to remember is to remember and to know that you are important and that you are amazing. And we're so fortunate that you are embracing now and what, what you're going to be able to do um, contributing to the MS field and that and, and making sure that your ego and your self-worth is not based on how necessarily other people treat you or how much you get paid, but that you're a good person and you're amazing. And, uh, and, and but shining a light on the inequities and the, the inequality is also really important. It just cannot define you. And that's one of the things this group is, I think, already doing, lifting everyone up. And it's hard. And it's, it's hard to hear the challenges that you face. Um, but you're, you're amazing and you're important and impressive and the best person to do the work you're doing right now. Thank you, Cindy. I think Fabian's raised a very uh, kind of cogent and uh, surprising point, actually. She says, Laura, thank you. Uh, IWIMS is actually proud to have 10 countries on this call. Wow. And so you're among friends. <laughs> So I just want to add a yeah. comment uh, from uh, Cindy. It's so good to see you, and uh, and thanks to uh, Manuel for organizing IWIMS a couple of years ago. Now it's been an amazing resource, especially during COVID, and and I really think it shows the power of collective women power. Um, <laughs> I think to the last point, uh, I take it very personally and poignantly. Um, I think for some of us who are over 50 um, and uh, are in sort of the legacy part of our careers, um, really using our platforms when we have uh, an ability to be in leadership positions to, to really support women, support equity, support maternity leave, um, it, this is really, I think, something that we can do. And, you know, Cindy, the National Mess Society supported me throughout my career, and I really feel like now I have an opportunity to, to pay back a bit. I'm going to be the chair of NMAC, and I think yeah. I'm the first female chair of the National yeah. um, Medical Advisory Committee for the MS Society. So, yeah, that's part of your payback. Thank you. <laughs> I can't wait for you to be to partake on that leadership role, Nancy. Thank you so much for stepping up into that. Of course, but I also want to thank all the women on the call too, and and uh, you know just encourage everyone to stick with it, and um, and we need to help each other, support each other, exactly, and uh, and and we will change, we will change the world, right, Cindy? Um, That's right. That's what 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 else? I mean, we should that we should go for the whole thing, change the whole world. <laughs> but uh, it, I guess that I would just say it does take time, so don't yeah. give up hope. Thank you.
Thanks. Thank you so much, Nancy, for those comments. And uh, again, if anyone has anything to add, please do. And Myla, I'm sure you're tired of listening to me. My kids tell me their bandwidth is about 10 seconds. <laughs> Uh, no, I just was going to say that this was the best hour of my week. Um, and I'm just really grateful to that, to our guest speakers and to everyone who attended and to those that um, brought forward their questions and to Fiona for asking me to help support this um, call today. And I'm going to go back and play on my bad days, Cindy's words. Um, to Laura about your, you know, you're the right person, you're doing the good work. And I think we all need more of that. And that was um, such a beautiful demonstration of the leadership that, that, you're, that you're talking about, Cindy. So that's it. I was just going to say thanks and um, that we can come back and visit this space virtually um, if we want to share it. And I think I'm looking to see, I don't see any questions. I see a lot of thank yous. Uh, Fiona, do you feel like we're ready to to call it? We are, but it? Cindy, and, yeah, and Cindy and Pam, we will heed your comments and mm -hmm. um, do something. You've given us all much to think about, but it won't stop there. We have work to do. So yes. thank you. Yes, and I'm excited about that opportunity. Okay, well, everybody, stay safe, stay healthy, continue to find balance, and until next time. Okay. And thank you. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. Great to be thank here. You so Take much. care. So Thanks, much. everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.